Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Embedded Linux Conference, and welcome to this session. Uh, I'm here with Harish Bansal. My name is Tim Bird. I'm a principal software engineer at Sony Electronics, and Harish is a technical engineer with TimeSys. And uh, this session is about Board Farm APIs for automated testing of embedded Linux. Specifically, this is an update to a talk that we gave last year. And uh, I like to throw the abstracts uh, into the slides so that people coming along later, if they just only have the slides, they have a little bit of an overview of the talk. But what we're gonna talk about today is uh, this outline. So I'm gonna review some of the REST API concepts uh, that we introduced last year. And then the main portion of this talk is going to be uh, talking about what we've accomplished in the last year. And uh, uh, one of the big features that I'll talk about is resource model, um, how that relates to the API. Uh, and uh, then we're gonna give you a bunch of demos. So we have uh, new APIs in several different areas. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about those APIs and give demos for power management, for camera and for serial port. And then one thing that is also pretty neat that we've done in the last year is we've extended the uh, API uh, to be able to use it from several different test frameworks. So uh, we'll show you a bunch of different ways that you can run tests uh, using the API uh, from Lava, from Fuego, and from the robot test framework, and even uh, standalone just on the board uh, or manually. And then we'll wrap up by giving some future directions. So. Uh, let me review just the kind of the overall concept and, and introduce the problem statement. So what problem are we trying to solve? Well, uh, the, the big problem in our opinion is that people can't share tests with each other. Um, and there's a lot of different tests that people run in their own labs, but there's no standardized way of accessing the hardware uh, in a board farm lab. So there are a lot of different test break frameworks, uh, things like kernel CI, or a robot test for framework, the things I mentioned earlier. Um, and there are a few board farm frameworks, uh, frameworks that exist for uh, managing boards, uh, but there's no standardized way between all these different labs and test frameworks to run tests. So uh, the problem is that uh, every farm, board farm, implements their test infrastructure differently. So what will usually happen is you'll get a bunch of boards in your lab or in your farm and you'll then you'll get some hardware to do things like power control or USB switching or uh, SD muxing or whatever. And, and you'll cobble together the hardware that you can get that's available. And then it's not a super hard thing, but you'll write a bunch of custom scripts uh, for control of that hardware and for data collection. Uh, and the problem is that it, it's different for every lab, right? So that test a test written for one lab was not going to work in another lab. The un end result of this is bad. It's that nobody can share their tests. And so we're missing out on kind of the open source effect of, uh, of in the QA area of Linux development. Um, so our solution is to create a standard method to access uh, a board farm. And uh, specifically, uh, this will allow technology uh, so that technologies can evolve separately from the interface to the farm. So that interface creates an abstraction layer. So if you write to the single interface, then behind the scenes, you know, drivers for different hardware can communicate. So the end result is that tests can be written to work that work in more than one lab. And uh, that's kind of the main goal. The other uh, thing that happens when you do this is that now test frameworks can actually work with more than one lab. Right, so uh, not just the tests, but the frameworks themselves. So this is a high level diagram showing uh, a bunch of different test frameworks. And if they all use the same API, they can talk to boards and these boards can reside hopefully anywhere in the world and they can reside in, in different types of labs um, and, uh, or, or in the same lab. So it, it completely abstracts away uh, that issue. And then if we drill down a little bit uh, further, um, we see that there are not just the board that you can control, uh, but there's hardware in the lab. So some of the APIs have to do with uh, manipulating or accessing the board, and, but a lot of the APIs, especially the ones we've added in the last year, have to do with controlling other 
hardware that you might find in the lab, like a power measurement or audio video capture or controlling the endpoints for uh, like serial port or USB connections in the lab where you have to manage not just the, the endpoint on the device under test, but the endpoint in another, uh, on another piece of hardware in the lab. So that's, that's the overall kind of concepts. Um, the REST API itself consists of kind of two major parts. We have a web-based REST API. So that is, uh, and then a command line interface. The REST API is based on HTTPS and JSON. So, uh, and the system that we're using is actually an extension to Lava or Django. Um, so Lava itself is a Django app and Django has popularized a particular style of, um, of API for manipulating objects on a web server. And so we just extended that existing API. And the great thing about it is that you can actually perform this API uh, using only two command line utilities, curl and jq. So jq is a command line utility that, that can manipulate and access fields in a JSON string. And uh, so jq stands for JSON query, I believe. Um, so you can actually perform all of the API uh, if you'd like uh, by just typing stuff straight on the command line using those two commands. But um, it's much more convenient if you use one of the command line tools that we've created. So we have a command line tool. It performs the same operations as the REST API, but it wraps up the, the parameters and the arguments for you. And, and so this is actually suitable for uh, both human use and for automated use. Um, and so now, so that's, that's kind of in the review. Now this is the main part of the talk, what has happened since last year. We've uh, actually accomplished quite a bit. Um, and I'm gonna talk about each of these. We're, we've added more implementations. Uh, we've added something called the resource model. Um, and I'll explain that uh, in just a bit. And then uh, associated with that resource model, we've kind of added a generic capture API model. Um, and then we went ahead and we added APIs for new resource types. So we have uh, APIs for power measurement, image and video capture, and serial port receive and, and transmit. And then we have a couple of other things, uh, kind of miscellaneous extensions that I'll talk about uh, when we get to that. Um, so the first thing is uh, implementations. And uh, the original implementation that we showed last year was a Lava server uh, that is based on Django. And this is the, the same Lava server that's used by Kernel CI and, and uh, many other uh, projects. Um, so this server uh, is actually in production now. Uh, TimeSys has a service called Embedded Board Farm, and they're providing production uh, services to uh, their clients and customers. And so the client for that is actually available now in a Git repository. Uh, it's a shell-based client using curl and jq. And uh, the, the, so, but we've extended that implementation obviously with the new APIs that we've produced this year. Um, the other thing that we have available is a, something called lab control and it's a server and client implementation. So the lab control server is a plain CGI script. It's not written to any particular framework. Um, and LC, which is the command line client for that is a Python client. So uh, we've got a client in Python and we've got a client in shell script. And uh, this Python client uses the Python request module. So it's going to format the um, commands or the, the wire protocol uh, according to the way, kind of the defaults that re that request module uses. So the source is available now, but it should be considered kind of alpha quality. It's not production grade yet, uh, but you can uh, get it and play around with it and uh, uh, see how it works. So uh, one of the reasons for doing uh, multiple implementations is that uh, you can find incompatibilities or you can you can shake out the API, right? To see, see how easy it is to implement, but also kind of what are some of the issues if you, you know, if you do it in different languages, that type of thing. So our ultimate goal, of course, is to use any client that's written to the API uh, and have it work effectively with any of the servers. And so we've done uh, a bit of compatibility testing between the clients that we have now and the servers we have now. And several of the APIs work uh, pretty well. 
Um, there's a couple of incompatibilities, but, uh, but we're kind of uh, working on those. Uh, most the incompatibilities are in some of the new APIs where um, places have diverged, but uh, the, the core APIs are all working uh, just fine. One of the things we found was that in using the Python request module, uh, it showed that there were some issues with the API definitions, uh, the specs that we had last year. So the curl command line tool and the request module from in Python actually perform the same operations with different uh, form encodings, uh, right? So you have to, in, in order to be compatible, you have to make sure that the wire protocol uh, matches exactly. Uh, so you can't be passing stuff in different formats. Um, so that was something we uh, discovered and started fixing. And uh, the other thing with these separate implementations is that um, both labs have other, have APIs that the other lab does not support for. So for example, um, uh, the EBF lab, uh, the TimeSys lab, has APIs for storage management, and they have some some other APIs for USB and and a couple other things that they're using for their production testing, um, and their customers that the the Sony lab that runs Lab Control does not have. So and then the Sony lab has serial receive transmit uh, APIs. So uh, there are a couple of differences in the implementation, but the core uh, that we discussed last year and and uh, the, the intent is to have the API supported uh, uniformly uh, throughout. Um, and then the uh, next thing I want to talk about is the resource model. Uh, this is probably the most important thing that we kind of uh, worked on this last year. So previously, all operations that you performed in the API were relative to a board. You can see in that uh, top line example that there's a, a board in the uh, URL string. And so you would have uh, a board, an action, and maybe some parameters, in this case, power on. Um, but we introduced a new resource model so that besides just being able to address boards, you can address resources in the lab. So first you get a resource that is associated with the, the operation type that you're gonna perform. And then you perform operations with that resource instead of the board. So for instance, in this example, there's a camera and we can do a start capture, and we, we address that to the camera, not to the board. Um, and uh, so there's a new API to retrieve that resource assignment uh, that is board-based, and then you use that resource in subsequent calls uh, to, to perform operations. So uh, the reason that this is uh, good is that it's much more flexible than just the board-specific model. Uh, so you can have resources in the lab uh, that um, where you can have more than one of the resource or of, the, of a particular resource type assigned to a board. So a good example is like a serial endpoint where you might have multiple serial ports on the board and multiple endpoints in the lab that correspond to the all, you know opposite endpoint of those. Or you might have multiple uh, probe points on a board for power measurement. So instead of just one power measurement, you could be taking power measurement from uh, several locations on the board. Um, and so uh, you need to be able to address more than just one of a particular resource type. The other thing is that, uh, so you can have multiple resources per board, but you can also have multiple boards per resource. So it's very common in a lot of labs to have a power control device that can, um, uh, that runs or controls multiple boards and there may be operations that you want to perform that are not board specific uh, like a bank power switch or something like that. Um, so also the resource model gives us a lot more flexibility in the future uh, for doing something that I call dynamic multiplexing uh, and that is the ability to take a resource uh, that is in the lab and use it with uh, more than one board you know, serially or sequentially. So you can control the resource assignment at runtime. So one example of that that you might think of is uh, like a video switcher. Uh, if you can control a video switcher uh, from the command line, uh, you can have it work with one board uh, for a particular test and then switch it and use it with another board. And so there's, there's uh, other pieces of hardware that are capable of doing that. So uh, makes it so that you can use hardware with more than one board. Uh, so this is not a feature that we have today, but the resource model kind of anticipates it and uh, should support it. 
without much uh, problem. Um, so this is actually kind of an even more detailed diagram showing uh, that relationship that I said, where so you might have multiple resources of, a, of the same type associated with the board. So audio video capture, you might have uh, multiple video outputs or power measurement, you might have multiple uh, probes. And so all of those uh, are available and you can access using the REST API and in particular, the new resource model. Um, so the supported resource types that we have right now that we worked on the last year, we worked on power measurement and camera and serial. Uh, but we think that other, uh, other resource types are obvious ones uh, that we would like to work on. So we'd like to work on CAN bus. Uh, we've actually already purchased some hardware for that and, and USB. I mentioned that uh, TimeSys already has a, a few APIs in their system that are working on this. So, so, uh, so that's the resource model. So another kind of related to that is what I'd call the generic capture API model. So uh, what we wanted to do is come up with an abstraction that can be used for lots of different resource types. And so really this is kind of the equivalent of, uh, uh, in Unix, it's the file, everything is a file. In, in, uh, in this system, uh, the REST API, everything is ca a capture. Well, not everything, but, uh, but you can apply these same verbs to a lot of different uh, resource types. So there's a start capture, stop capture, get data, and delete. And those are kind of the basic verbs uh, that you use for any particular resource where you're doing data collection. And uh, so in looking at how these are used with different resources, so in power measurement, that's basically it. You have start, capture, stop, get data, and delete. Um, and then as we started to extend the API for other, other systems um, or other resource types, we determined that there were uh, extra parameters that might be nice to have or uh, convenience functions that were nice. And so we added a couple of uh, other APIs that you see there in red. So for image and video capture, uh, we can capture a still image. Uh, we can also, we added start capture with a duration. So if you want to, uh, instead of having to come back and, and manually do a stop capture, you just say, well, I want 60 seconds of video. Um, you can do that. And then get ref is a call that will <clears throat> return a URL for a video file without you having to download it. And you, you can download it if you want, uh, but uh, GitRef allows you to just leave it on the server and you can reference it uh, during the test that way. And then for serial port, we also added a couple of things uh, having to do with, well, one for when you're dealing with a lot of buses, <laughs> you're gonna have to do some configuration. So we added a set config thing, uh, uh, API, and that is used for uh, configuring things like the baud rate or uh, transmitter receive mode. Um, and then for uh, serial port receive, oh, and this is the DUT is the receiver, it's the device under test is the receiver. So the lab resource is a transmitter. So all these other APIs have to do with capture. Uh, this is actually uh, one, the opposite one. This is essentially the right operation, which is put data. And so these are, these are kind of the new APIs and how they fit into uh, the, the resource model. And <clears throat> Uh, now, just to wrap up here, a couple other things that we did um, is that we added direct support for the API in Fuego. So last year, uh, when we did our demos, Fuego was using e, uh, EBF, which was the only client uh, at the time, uh, but I was using it via a wrapper called TTC. So uh, Fuego already had support for, for this, I'll call it a transport layer. Um, but that was awkward for a couple of reasons. So it's been modified, Fuego has been modified. So now uh, Fuego can use, specify a transport of either EBF or LC uh, for a board and the tests are performed using that API directly. So there's less configuration inside the Fuego Docker container. This is mostly of interest to Fuego, Fuego users, but uh, kind of shows that you can, you can use this stuff via wrappers, but it's better to kind of integrate it more tightly. Okay, so uh, some of the other things that we've done, just a couple of miscellaneous features uh, were that we've added support for recursive directory copy. So last year we could copy individual files to and from the device under test. And so now we can copy an entire directory. 
uh, either to or from upload or download. Uh, also, in terms of debugging, we've added a dash dash debug argument to EBF, uh, and this is really handy. It generates a, a trace of the API request. So that means you can get kind of detailed information about the HTTP request and response, uh, the, the structures that were used and the encoding and stuff. And uh, that's actually very, very useful to see those data structures on the wire, uh, especially when you're writing uh, implementations that are supposed to be compatible. So. Um, so that's a that's a new feature, and then also in the test repository or in the EBF repository, um, Board Farm REST API, uh, that we created a new directory that has sample tests. So you can see, and in fact, some of the tests that we'll show later on uh, as demos are actually available. You can look at those tests and see how they run, and and so that I think will be helpful for people uh, trying to experiment with the API. So now I'd like to go ahead and turn the time over to Harish uh, to look at a lab independent power measurement test. So Harish, go ahead. Thank you, Tim. Lab independent power measurement test. Uh, this test captures power measurement data for a device while running some workload on the device. Workload could be any CPU, memory, or file system ex extensive operation, analyzes the collected data, and reports result. In the lab, device under test DOT is connected to a, a lab resource, a power measurement lab resource. In this example, uh, DOT is a Raspberry Pi board and a lab resource is Acme power measurement uh, port. Lab knows the binding of DOT with power measurement resource. It knows which uh, Raspberry Pi is connected with which Acme uh, power measurement port or which BeagleBone Black is connected with which uh, Sony debug port. Before going into detail of uh, power measurement test uh, and REST API, let's have a look at power measurement demo. In this video, we are going to see three different uh, ways of running power measurement test, test execution directly on the device, running it from a remote system and test running as Lava framework uh, test job. So here is the first example of uh, direct test execution on the device. For this, uh, we will be accessing device console through TimeSys EBF web interface. EBF stands for embedded board form. This is the device. The black portion of the screen is a device console. Here we are running our measurement test grid, which is already deployed on the device. Test is running, currently it's performing some workload uh, stress test, CPU stress test on the device. We could see power measurement reading. Max power consumed is 2.141 watt, which is below threshold configured of 2.5 volt and our test passed. Next running the same test script on a remote computer. So this uh, computer, which is running test script is in India, whereas uh, our device uh, server and lab resources are in a lab in Pittsburgh. All the interaction between test script and lab is happening over uh, the REST API. There is no need for the VPN or any other uh, connectivity. So it ran the test and this time max power used just 2.133 watt. Good, below the threshold configured. Now we are running a test through Lava framework, which takes care of test scheduling and result collection. We manually curated a Lava test job YAML, which would run our power measurement test script on the Raspberry Pi 3 device, which we copied on the screen. So I'm the test job, waiting for device allocation for test execution. Device got executed, test job is running. We could see Lava test job logs coming on the screen. So our test executed and this time uh, max power is low 2.102 watts. And if we go to Lava test results, Could check power measurement test, test result status is pass. 
So this was a short demo of uh, power measurement. Just let's get under the hood and see how REST APIs are working. Uh, so here is a snippet of a power measurement test scripts. The statements which are highlighted are CLI tools command, which uh, invokes power measurement REST APIs. The test starts by grabbing a power measurement resource. Then it uh, starts power measurement uh, data logging by running power measurement start commands. Then it runs some workload CPU stress test on the device. Once the stress testing is done, it stops the data logging. It grabs the data, it computes the max power, deletes the data from the server, and finally compares the max power uh, with a threshold to pass off in the test. These are the CLI tool commands for power measurement operations. Get resource, start capture, stop capture, get data, and delete data. In the CLI command, this test client is lab dependent. For uh, TimeSys lab, it would be EBF. For Sony, it would be L LC. The, the CLI commands and the underlying REST APIs and uh, their specification are same. So if you want to run the same test on different lab, you could read uh, this test client value from a test config file or an environment variable, and then the same test would run uh, on different uh, labs, so different infrastructures. Since these are the REST APIs uh, used by the CLI tool and our test. All these APIs, they return a JSON object in the output with uh, three properties, result, data, and message. Result is either success or fail. In case any operation fails, a failure reason is returned as message value. Data value is API specific. For get resource, it returns power measurement resource ID. For stack capture, it returns a unique token which represent the current uh, power measurement data logging which is taking place. And in case of get data, it returns a CSV string with power measurement readings where each row has timestamp, voltage, and current readings. Next is our lab independent camera test. This test uh, records video of a device while it reboots. In the lab, uh, our device under test or DOT is associated with uh, two lab resources this time, a camera resource and a power controller resource. And DOT knows the binding of these resources with camera. Camera resource uh, takes video of the device, whereas power controller is responsible for rebooting the board. Let's see a short demo of camera test. So again, we are logging into EBS web interface here. This is the device used for camera test. As we see here, device is currently powered on, device console is operational. And if you look at live video streaming, device LED is on and uh, desktop screen is visible on the monitor attached. Now we are running this camera test from a remote system. The first argument is the device name and second argument is for how long you would like to do video recording. It's rebooting the code. And in the terminal, it prints out URL of the recorded video. Let's play this video. So as you see here, initially device is on, LED is glowing. Now the device is off, it's going through reboot. Procedure, LED is on, device is booting up. Could see boot locks coming on the screen. Uh, an important point is the this camera resource which we are using for video recording, we could also use the same resource for uh, capturing still images of the device as well. Booting is almost done. Yeah, booting sequence is over. So 
So this was a short demo. Now here is our camera test script. Again here, uh, the highlighted statements are CLI commands, which uses camera APIs, the camera REST APIs. Test starts with grabbing a camera resource here. It starts recording a video for a pre-configured duration, reboots the board. Once uh, the duration is over, it uh, prints out uh, URL of the recorded video on the terminal with the code. These are the CLI commands for camera operations, get resource capture, start capture, and get reference. Get resource is similar to power measurement, to get resource resource. Only difference here is instead of uh, power measurement, resource type is camera. Capture takes a still image of the device and returns URL of the captured image with minus O argument. Uh, that image is downloaded on the local system, which is running the CLI tool. Start capture, uh, re start recording a 10 second video with minus T argument. We could record video of any duration, less or greater than the 10 second. Get reference, uh, it returns URL of recorded video with minus O argument similar to capture, it downloads the video on the local system. These are the REST APIs for camera. Again, uh, these APIs also return a JSON object with result data and message properties. Data here uh, has value of uh, camera resource ID. Capture has a URL of the still image. Start capture returns a JSON with a uh, token property, which has a unique uh, video ID of the current video capture, which is taking place. And get reference returns a uh, URL of the recorded video as data value. Uh, with this, I hand over to Tim again to give us insight of serial test. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Um, so uh, in the Sony lab, we've implemented uh, serial port testing and uh, this shows the diagram. We've got a device under test and it's connected with a serial cable uh, from one of its UARTs out to a lab resource, which is uh, capturing it. Um, and so the steps are, are pretty straightforward. Um, the first thing is to configure the lab resource. In this case, this is a, a transmit test that I'm gonna show. So uh, it would be configure the lab resource uh, to receive and then set the baud rate on that side using the REST API. And then we use uh, local commands on the device under test to set the set it into that end into transmit mode and with the baud rate. And then we initiate the capture, uh, and we or we start the cap capturing, start receiving on the uh, lab side, and then sending on the DUT side. And then we end the capture, collect the data, and compare it. And uh, that's the basics of the test. So uh, let's go ahead and show you. I'll show you some uh, this test running from Fuego. Um, in the Fuego, I've got a board. It's a Beagle in black. It's called LCBBB. And I'm going to start this uh, board farm serial transmit test. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start the build on that. And uh, this is using the Jenkins interface. That's the Fuego's kind of preferred user interface. Um, and then so we get some set up stuff out of the way, and then we start uh, measuring uh, stuff. So notice that we've uh, found the resource name for that UART1, which is serial GE. And then we're gonna test a bunch of different baud rates, and we're gonna do the same steps for each baud rate. So we're gonna configure the baud rate, uh, and then uh, capture the data, transmit the data from the DUT, stop the capture, and then retrieve the captured data, and then compare it, and if everything compares okay, then then uh, uh, we call that a pass. Uh, we have uh, operations to download the data from the server and um, then look at the overall set of uh, results and see we get all pass results for all these different baud rates. So that is, a, that is a pass on that hardware test. So, and then the same thing, looking at um, what it looks like in practice in terms of the APIs, you see highlighted um, lines here 
showing that in order to do the set config, uh, we actually send some formatted JSON to uh, the set config command, and that allows us to have an ar kind of arbitrary uh, attributes uh, corresponding to whatever um, whatever attributes apply to a particular resource. So for a serial endpoint, you'd have a baud rate, maybe things like uh, X on, X off, um, uh, or stuff like that. Um, for other resources, you might have uh, other parameters that you want to set. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the same types of patterns you've seen with the other tests, we get a token when we start the capture, we can use that use that token to actually stop the capture and retrieve the data. And then at the bottom there, you see us comparing the send data and the receive data uh, to validate that the, the transmission went properly. Um, so in terms of the CLI command tools, again, very, very similar. The only thing I kind of want to point out that's different here is uh, on the Git resource, notice that there's an extra parameter uh, called the feature. So, and this has to do with the uh, being able to identify which endpoint in the lab you're you're referring to. So, uh, the BeagleBone Black actually has five different UARTs, and so you have to identify to the lab well which which serial connection are you are you referring to. In this case, we're referring to uh, UART one, um, which is on a certain set of pins, and uh, so we have to find the lab endpoint that that has the connection to that UART one. So you could actually have multiple serial ports defined in your lab and connect it up and, and test them independently. Um, other than that, the API is basically uh, the same as, as the other uh, capture. So the capture model has actually turned out to be uh, fairly um, generic, generic enough to use in, with multiple different resource types with, with tweaks here and there, as you see, as we, you know, as we flesh out the API. Uh, and then looking at the uh, API details, the same type of thing. So we have uh, a bunch of paths that we pass as part of the URL. Uh, again, the only difference on the Git resource is the addition of a feature at the end of that path. And then we're returning JSON, uh, same thing, result, data, and message in the case of failure. Um, so, that's, so that's the serial API test. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, the other thing that we'd like to talk about that we're pretty excited about actually is that we have run uh, this API or used this API from multiple different frameworks. So you've already seen an example of a power management test uh, running standalone, uh, running remotely, uh, and running in Lava. Uh, and uh, it showed the serial test in Fuego. We want to show the same power management test with uh, two other frameworks. So we'll show you the robot test framework and then Fuego running the power measurement test. Um, and so this is kind of the Rosetta Stone. We're gonna show you some code from each of these and there's lots of similarities, but it also helps you kind of understand, well, how do, how do each of these systems, where, where would you put uh, the call outs to the, to the client and, and stuff like that? So let's go ahead and I think we're starting with a demo, right? For robot test framework. Robot Framework. Uh, robot Framework is a general purpose framework for automation. It's Python based, easy to install with Python pip command. You could simply run pip install robot framework to install it on your system. This is a power measurement test written for robot framework. Uh, it uses same CLI uh, commands and power measurement REST APIs as the previous uh, test we showed earlier in the talk. Uh, in, in this test, uh, we first import process module for running CLI tool commands. Then there are a bunch of variables which are defined here. And then uh, under test cases section, there is only one test case, uh, get power measurement test. And all these uh, test steps are same as uh, the shell script based power measurement test, uh, for scrabble power measurement test resource, starts power measurement, runs some workload command on the device. Once the command execution is over, stops the data logging, grab the data, computes max power. Uh, then there is a verification point, uh, should be true, where it compares max power with threshold to pass or fail the test case. And finally, it deletes the data from the server. Now let's look 
at a video of this robot framework test in execution. So we are running uh, this uh, robot test script on a remote system. We could run it from terminal or from the UI. Here we are running it on directly on the terminal, which robot command, it's executing the test. It prints the result summary on the console, also generate a nice HTML report. Let's have a look at this report. So robot framework consider each uh, script as a suite. So you click on the suite and then it shows uh, individual test case results. So it, it had only one test case. If you click on the test case, it uh, trails down and shows the test case logs. So that was a very short demo of robot framework power measurement test. Now it's over to Tim. Okay, so now I'd like to show the same thing uh, running in Fuego, a power measurement test using the REST API. So we're gonna run a, a video here. Uh, once again, we're in the Jenkins user interface. I'm gonna be running it on the LCBBB board and uh, go ahead and start the, start the test. And uh, we can go look at the console for the test and see that uh, that first line there, we've got the ACME resource that we determined was associated with this. Uh, we're gonna start measuring uh, the power at this point and uh, start a, a stress workload. While we do that, I'll go back and look at the um, historical data for this test. We see that we have a reference uh, power usage of 2.2 uh, watts and none of the previous tests have gone over that, although that, that build or that test run almost did. Uh, but we'll go and look at the uh, test and see that it's finishing up the, the stress operation. And uh, we're gathering the power measurement data that was collected at the server. And the first few seconds are uh, a little bit less current as we get into the workload. You can see the current goes up uh, from about 250 to 380. Um, so, uh, but the overall maximum power used is still, uh, let's see, 2.17 watts. And so uh, that was a test that passed. Um, so uh, in Fuego, uh, we're gonna be doing the same types of operations with the client that we did in, in other systems. Uh, Fuego tests are written, written in, uh, in shell script language. And so it's, it's very similar. Um, uh, just a couple of differences that might be of note here is uh, uh, that when we, um, the, the Fuego has the parser in a separate module. And so when we get the power measurement data, we actually emit that into the test log uh, with some delimiters, start power data and end power data. So that makes it easier for the parser to extract just the power data uh, and then perform its analysis against, you know, relative to the threshold and, and calculate the max power. Um, so, but that's what it looks like for a uh, Fuego power management test. Uh, so there, we've showed you uh, several different uh, power measurement tests in Lava, Robot Framework, and Fuego. Uh, what we'd like to do now is this is, uh, we'd like to promote the use of the API and these implementations. So the implementations are available now. Uh, you can go out and play around with them. If you have any questions about them, please uh, contact me or Harish. And uh, there's actually, I think, a mailing list that you can get on if you're interested. Uh, some of the things that we want to do is we want to add more APIs. So we've done a lot, but we're, we have more stuff that we want to do. So CAN bus is next on the list. I kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, we expect to be able to use the same uh, APIs, second fig, capture, and put uh, for CAN bus operations so we can do hardware testing. We'd like to do USB connect and disconnect testing. So um, we have hardware that can, can do some of that. That is useful for... Um, uh, testing like the robustness of uh, mass storage or uh, connections to other devices and, uh, that are connected on the USB bus. Uh, but the, the question that we have for you is what APIs would you like to see? So um, we, we'd like to hear about what types of hardware testing you're doing in your lab, how you're going about that, and whether or not this API 
uh, fits that model. Uh, we want to find more use cases and and uh, if we need to change the API, uh, we can still do that. We're in early stages here, uh, but we'd like to see if this model works and then continue to extend it for use cases for uh, throughout the industry. The other thing is we'd like to add more clients and client examples. So LTP is a Linux test project. They have a serial port test. It's a hardware test and we'd like to see if we can uh, run that in conjunction with uh, our, e uh, our clients. And, uh, and then also we need to upstream our changes uh, from the EBF uh, production server to the Lava upstream project. Um, and then uh, we would, the big thing here is to use this in more production testing. So uh, we're gonna find out more about the APIs and the use cases as we uh, do more real world testing. Uh, and that'll help refine the APIs. Um, and then uh, last thing here, uh, so we have defined an API now that is between essentially the, the test or the test framework and the lab server uh, the, or the board farm server. Uh, and that is a good place to have an API that uh, allows us to uh, standardize one aspect of the entire test stack. Another aspect or another part of the stack is the interface between the server and the lab hardware. So uh, we'd like to establish standards that would allow us to drop lab hardware uh, into existing labs. And uh, so uh, one example of that, right, is there's something called a Sony debug board that does power measurement and it does power control and, and serial port capture. Uh, it'd be nice if I could, so I have it all configured so it runs in uh, my Sony lab, but it'd be nice if uh, I could just ship one of those uh, as a device out to someone else's lab, the TimeSys lab, and have them install it and just drop into place. Uh, so essentially what we're talking about would be like the hardware drivers for resources to make that a standard as well. So that's not something we have today, but that's something that uh, we view as important long-term. And uh, so we'll be working on that as well, um, trying to consolidate that. So with that, I think, we are done with the presentation. So this is our update of our automated board farm REST APIs. And uh, we look forward to hearing uh, feedback and, and comments from you. That's the reason we come to these conferences to kind of tell you what we've done and, and get more information. And, and uh, we will be here. Uh, I should be there in person. Uh, if I'm not, something has gone horribly wrong. And uh, we'll be available in chat and uh, and uh, we, we can talk to you uh, with any questions or comments you have. So with that, I'll say thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll see you around.